international company, Tony Lockwood was hurtling towards the peak of his career when he suffered a life-changing incident on March the 7th, 2012. Tony's with me today to discuss education, career and overcoming such a catastrophic event. Welcome, Tony, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Christy. I appreciate the invite. So I really appreciate you speaking with me today, especially given we're going to be talking about such a horrific chapter in your life that while I know is ingrained, I'm sure is one that you'd much prefer to forget. But before we get to that fateful date, I'd really like to discuss the early years of your education and career. So I know you're from Canada, but I'm not sure how old you were when you moved to Australia. Did you complete your studies in Australia or Canada? So I came to Australia first when I was 20. So I finished high school um, in Canada and um, then I worked for basically a year and a half, two years or whatever it was. And then uh, decided, well, I, a long time earlier, I decided to travel to Australia, but I wanted to finish school and basically be, be able to, you know, save up some money and travel to Australia. So, um, yeah, I came over here when I was 20 originally. So when you're in high school, did you know what you wanted to do with your life? Oh, I think what I wanted to do and what I actually ended up doing are two different things, but I wanted to be a marine biologist, I think, as a lot of people do, um, or, or something along the lines of working in conservation environment. Um, obviously, that uh, didn't happen, but um, uh, yeah, so I still enjoy what I do now, but uh, diff different, different route to what I ended up on. So is that one of the reasons why you came to Australia to sort of chase the, the marine life? Uh, the reason I came to Australia goes back into my into my uh, year grade two or year two. Um, a friend of mine who I went to school with, uh, his mum was Australian, and he, they came over for a holiday. And then when they came back to Canada to our to class, he brought in all these photos of Australia, and I just absolutely fell in love with the place. And just from his photos and the and all the stories that he had to tell me, I just kind of from that point on in my life, I always said I'm going to go to Australia, and I kind of. So I guess if you go back a bit further, when I was 16, I was with my best friend. Um, and we were just sitting there and talking. And he said, what are we going to do when we finish school? I said, I'm going traveling. And he says, where are you going? Going to Australia. And he goes, okay, let's do that. And literally one day he rang me up in, in what are they, about 19 and a half. He said, I'm going to be on Australia on this date. And we said, okay, let's do it. And that's exactly what we did. Wow. And is he still in Australia? No, nah, he's back in Canada. Uh, there, was, there was four of us that ended up coming over uh, as the, the, the initial group. And um, all, the, all the other guys are back in Canada. So when you left high school, I'm not sure what, type, what age you are when you finished high school in Canada, but what did you do straight from school? Uh, look, I, I finished at, um, I think I was 17 and a half or close to 18 when I finished. Um, I'd already had kind of a job. I'd been working at the, a hire company over in Canada since I was 15. I started off there just kind of as a yard hand mechanic slash cleaning machines and stuff. And then um, as soon as I finished school, I kind of went there and worked there full time. So I didn't, I didn't jump straight back in any studies at that point. So in your early career, when you did come to Australia, you stayed in your roles for long periods of time. I think you had six years, eight years, and then another eight year stint. Now in today's standard, that's quite a lifetime. So what do you believe the main reasons were that you stayed with those employers for so long? Well, those, I think, I think I stayed with those employers for that long. I think um, if you look back, I guess I was young, I was keen. Um, and there was probably a lot of opportunities for me to move up in the businesses and expand and, and grow. Um, I guess as you obviously get older and you're more experienced behind you, but the, the opportunities kind of start to, to become a little harder to find. But I, I think mo mainly those, those companies I was working for, I could change jobs and progress. And, and especially in, in, the, um, in a couple of the businesses, I was being, doing educational stuff as well, which was keeping me very motivated to, to do my role. So. Yeah, so you went on to study an advanced diploma in business management with the University of New England while you were working as a branch manager, which is quite a senior role within a large national organisation. So what made you return to the books? Uh, when I started at that company, um, and I was 23 when I started there, the role that I actually took on was a trainee manager, and that's how that's the role they employed me for. Um, and as part of that role, it was to go to TAFE and do a couple, um, a couple, a two-year course in basically management, um, which I did, and I really enjoyed it. <clears throat> After I finished that two-year course, I went and did another another three years at TAFE, and just kept going and kept going and kept finding myself doing more and more management roles, just continuously learning, and I really, really enjoyed it. And um, so that opportunity came up for the University of New England, and and that um, and that that diploma, and I just jumped at it, and it was great. And, 
um, just again help me grow as a as a as in my knowledge and and as a person. I think <clears throat> one of the things with with learning is not only about what you learn, but it's about the people you meet. I think when you go to all these different classes, you're meeting all these different people with different experiences, and you learn a lot from those people. That's what I've always found. So, did you have a lot of networking events through that university through that course? Uh, yeah, we did a few. Um, it was a few, yeah. And we got to meet a fair few people, but it was within, we kept it, that that course was actually done within the business I was working in. So there was, there was I think it was 40 people entirely from the business that we're working in. So we're all kind of in similar, not similar roles, but in the business. So we all kind of had connections in some way or another. So I was going to ask how supportive your employer was. So obviously, if, you know, if there was 40 people within the organization doing it how much time did they allow you to spend within your working time as opposed to you having to do it in your personal time? Oh, I don't, uh, it's the time that they probably allowed the time. It was trying to find the time in a busy role to actually do it. So I always found myself doing most of it after hours. Um, it, uh, the roles I, in an operations role, you're generally bouncing around, you know, seven to five every day. So you don't have a lot of time to just stop and, and do do book work but um i always found myself doing it late at night after i put the kids to bed that's what i generally find my you know from eight o'clock till 10 or 10 at eight till 11 that's when i generally did my studies um sometimes it was still two or three in the morning but um you know that's what you do to get through the courses but uh generally yeah they're very supportive all the businesses i work for have been extremely supportive of, of education um but you know you're trying to find the time within your day to actually manage that's the hard part so it is very demanding to have to do, you know, work full time, have a family and then study on top. How did you find the balance of that? Yeah, uh, that was difficult. Um, I guess when I when I started when I started studying, I guess my kids were when I started actually when I, I didn't have kids when I started studying. So um, my kids, I guess they kind of don't know any different. Like, um, as you know, my daughter just turned 18 and she's probably never really seen me not doing some sort of external study of some sort since she's been around um it's very hard to juggle when you've got the kids especially babies and stuff and you know you're exhausted as as a, a parent and you just want to go to sleep but then you've got these the assignments due so you just you just find a way to do it i'm not really sure how you kind of do it sometimes you just find a way just make it happen that's it so not long after completing that diploma you moved on to another large national organization and then worked as an operations manager for two states so do you think that diploma helped you secure that new role uh, definitely yeah definitely i think it definitely did i think all that education helps you grow as a, as a manager and as a leader so i think that definitely would yeah did you have any issues with the organization when you did decide to move on given the fact that they'd given you the opportunity to study uh no i i, I don't uh, believe so i think I, I, I believe in never burning your bridges when you leave a business and i don't you know i don't I don't think I've ever left a business because of the actual business. I've left it because I see opportunities for myself to grow uh, and learn. Um, and it might sound a bit selfish saying that, but I, I kind of, when you move a role, you want to, you take all the good bits from the one business you're in, you move to the next business and you kind of grab all the good bits from there as well. So, um, you know, I look at it probably a bit more of a selfish type thing, I guess you might say. <laughs> Now, speaking about learning and growing, a few years later, you hit the books again and completed a Master's of Management with the University of Wollongong. So what was your main driver with wanting to do a Master's degree? Uh, the um, the Master's was uh, definitely, uh, I don't really know what made me want to do it. I just kind of had this urge to do it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't really know why. I just had this urge to, it, it was a really good course. I was actually walking through I was walking through Cronulla and they, um, Wollong Wollongong University had a little stand set up just uh, as a uh, promoting it. And I kind of went over and I started looking through some of the stuff. And I said, oh, that's really good. That's really interesting. And the, you know, all the different components of the master's degree and everything. I thought that's really good. And, and then, um, I was, uh, spoke to my wife at the time and she's like, yeah, that's good. And then the next thing you know, I, I went to the open night and I signed up for it and started. So it all happened very quickly. So once you're on, you couldn't really jump off. Uh, I put it this way: I came home after the um, after the the open night, uh, and I said to my wife, "I said, oh look, I've signed up for the course." And she's like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "Well, I've signed up." She goes, "How are you going to manage that?" And I went, "I don't know yet." And um, <laughs> basically, again, we had young kids and took on a probably took on a bit more than I I took a bite bigger than I could chew, but um, 
we managed it. So how much more difficult was the master's degree than the advanced diploma? Uh, it was it's quite a bit more difficult a lot a lot, a lot more reading a lot more a lot more study a lot more a lot more hours on the books and actually set, uh, researching and and doing the actual findings um you know I, like i said i did it through the university of Wollongong, and um we did it at uh, the campus at loftus and uh you know i used to go there two days a week uh, i think it was three and a half hours for two days a week and then you know you'd go home and basically study all night and then every night you had off your studying and that's when I when I say I was up till two and three o'clock in the morning. That's when you doing these assignments and stuff. For me, I'm not an academic like some guys that can just do an assignment in one night and smash it and make it look really good. I take it takes me a little longer to do the assignments. So, uh, but it was extremely it was, it was very difficult but rewarding. But do you think your previous experience with your study with your um, graduate diploma was oh sorry your advanced diploma helped you in the way that you were able to study? Uh, funny you ask that. Um, probably yes, a little bit, but not really. I, the first assignment I handed in to the, um, the lecturer, he uh, he grabbed me after the course and said, "Look, Tony, I just have a chat with you." And um, so he goes, "Look, come in next week early. I'm going to show you how to write an assignment because 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 I'm not going to take this assignment as it is. You need to rewrite it. You know, it's got some good content. However, you need to format it and everything right, and so on and so forth." And uh, so, as much as I thought I knew, when you go to that level, you got to step it up a bit and um, the lecture was such a great guy. He literally just told me what you what you need to do and, and made it really simple for me to understand. Um, I'm a visual learner, so I'm not a, I'm not a real I'm not a bookworm. Um, so it's uh, for me it was it was good to have somebody just sit there and explain it and made my life going through and being the first assignment that I'd written. It made it really good for the rest of that is that course. So how much support do you think the university gave you? Because that lecturer sounds like you know somebody that sort of went not necessarily above and beyond, but took the interest into making sure that your education process was going to be a good one. So was that the sort of vibe that you got from that university? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they were, they were, um, again, there was, they were all the lectures I had. I, I don't know if I was lucky. They were, they were you know, really good, uh, especially, especially that gentleman. He was, he was exceptional. Um, but uh, most of them were always willing to help you and, and, you know, you could email them and they were always good at giving you feedback and stuff. So from a supportive point of view, I think, yeah, that, like I said, Wollongong, from a university point of view, I couldn't fault them. So you sort of joined or signed up the Masters on a whim, um, but did your ambitions change from the time you started that degree to the time that you completed it? Um, I don't think my ambitions changed. I think um, I've always wanted to be in senior management roles and I think when you do a master's degree like that, it, it um, again, it the the cohort that you're going to, to to class with. You know, I was going to class with mechanical engineers, aviation engineers, um, you know, corporate governance officers, and in, in large organizations, guys that were, you know, I, I felt very. I was just an operations manager down the bottom here, and I'm talking to these guys that are, and and literally there was one guy who was a nuclear physicist, and I was like, this is a, this is not this is not real, but. Um, you know, these, um, there's such a high level of caliber of people in there that you can just learn so much from. Um, my ambitions didn't change. Uh, I always wanted to get into a senior role via education. And um, but I think the people in that you meet helped me get there. So you finished the Masters in 2011. And then in March of the following year, you were involved in a horrendous car accident while traveling for work. So could you just tell us a little bit about that day and what happened? Yeah, let's say um, it's, a, it's a, what eight years ago now, so it's um, a bit of a moment in my life that I I will never forget. But uh, I was up in uh, I was with two of my work colleagues, so I was the state manager in WA. So I'd actually moved my family over to WA six weeks earlier, um, and then we took I had to go up to do a trip to one of the mine sites up in Tom Price, um, and we, <clears throat> we were driving to the site. And we left. Tom Price, we stayed up at uh, Tom Price, or no, so we stayed at um, Kerr Arthur, we were driving Tom Price. And um, we were about an hour from the mine site where, where we were on a dirt road. Um, you're lucky to see a car every five or 10 minutes. Um, anyways, there was a truck coming at us, a semi-trailer, um, and it's a dirt road. The speed limits are, I think, about 110, and you're cruising along pretty rapidly. And um, so behind the truck, what we didn't know was a big dust cloud, and behind that truck was a gentleman who was going to try to pass. And he um, he went to pass that semi trailer, and in the process, and in the dust cloud, he couldn't see us, and he hit his head on. Um, 
So we were doing, I know we were doing about 80 because um, of the, dr the driver of our vehicle. Uh, he actually saw the dust cloud and he slowed down, but the guy behind the truck was believed to be doing around 100 or so and um, hit his head on. And that kind of obviously put us into a bit of a spiral. Or there was three of us in the vehicle and um, yeah, it was, uh, we, we all ended up fairly, we're all still here. All four of us that were in the accident are still alive and still able to talk about it. And we're all still walking and everything. However, we all suffered some pretty horrific injuries. I think um, from my own point of view, uh, I, what I, I had, um, let's go through the injuries, got bleeding on the brain. I broke my neck in three places. I broke C1, C2, and C3. I broke my collarbone. I broke all the ribs that were in line with the seatbelt. Um, so both sides, so they're just both broken on both sides. Um, broke my back in L1, T12. So I've got that, that's fused. Um, I had a lacerated spleen, lacerated liver. I lost half my bowel. Uh, I lost my appendix, not that they matter. Um, I have a massive hernia that runs across the front of my stomach and around the side where all the muscle was actually destroyed, um, which is held together with a bunch of mesh and everything in there. Now I got three layers of mesh that holds all that together. Um, broke my hand, my wrist. I think that was about it. <laughs> That's so. enough. That's enough. That's horrific. <laughs> now, for those sort of listeners that don't really understand that area, it is very remote over in WA on those roads. So yeah. how long did it take for medical care to come? Um, yeah, it took it took an hour for the ambulance to get there. So so luckily enough, the mine sites that we were traveling to are are quite large, massive mine sites, and they actually have their own ambulance facilities on site. So the, the guy that the gentleman that hit us, um, he was actually coming from the mine site that we were actually traveling to go see. And um, he uh, he was actually able still to walk. So he was actually still able to get out of his vehicle. He broke his hip and a few other things, but he was still able to get out of his vehicle. And he actually called the called for help straight away. I think he had a satellite phone. So because we were it's in the middle of nowhere. It's like a dusty desert where we actually had the accident. Um, and he was able to get out of the car, call the ambulance. Um, and then I think shortly after that, another truck stopped actually and started giving us a hand as well. Um, we were all conscious in the vehicle. So we all kind of kept communicating to each other and, um, and until the ambulance got there. So how was your medical care coordinated? Cause you spent quite a lot of time in hospital. So how did that work? Yeah. So I spent four and a half months. So I guess from the, from the accident, they um, chucked us in the ambulance and took us to the, um, took us to, well, I went from the ambulance into Tom Price hospital. Um, from Tom Price Hospital, they, they basically said I need to get down to Perth to the to the major facility. Um, they had me on the Royal Flying Doctor, I think, within four hours, um, and then in surgery probably four hours after that, and then woke up four days later, and then yeah, four and a half months later, not well, I, I was in and out of hospital a few times. They let me out, and then I was back in because I had some complications and stuff with my stomach and that. Um, but yeah, four and a half months later, and I finally was able to get out of hospital and stop uh, going crazy inside those walls. So you ha you were married with a couple of young kids at the time. So how did they take that news? So yeah, so my wife at the time, she uh, obviously, as anyone would, I guess, was pretty shocked and pretty. Uh, she she tells the story when she took the phone call. She thought it was somebody telling her a joke or or playing a bad joke on her. Um, but the doctor was on the phone saying, "No, your husband's getting flown down from from Carrara at the moment. And he'll be in hospital here. So it's like you need to be in the hospital." Um, and yeah, my kids were on the phone. They didn't really probably at that point didn't realize the, the severity of it. Um, so yeah, so my wife took it pretty hard. Um, and, uh, yeah, she was, she was a bit, a bit rough on her, but, um, when she got, when, when I actually got to the hospital, there was, um, you know, she was waiting for me and then basically said hello and apologized to her. Cause you know, she's always telling me I shouldn't travel and it's always dangerous to travel. And I'm, I was always brushed it off saying, ah, it's fine. It's all good. You know, no problems. And that's one of those things until it happens to you, you realize how quickly and easily it can happen. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, from that point, it was, it was, yeah, a long way. And at that point they actually said, you know, the, to bring my parents over from Canada because they, they weren't sure at that point whether I'd make it or not. Um, so yeah, they had my, my business and, the, and this is my business was extremely supportive of all, all this stuff, but um they actually had my parents on a plane within 24 hours in Canada. They called them, booked flights, had them on the plane and, and arrived. Uh, I think they arrived in Australia three days later. And um, I was still, I was in a coma at that point. I was in a, an induced coma. So when I woke up, my, my parents were sitting above my bed, which was quite interesting. 
So did, was that quite scary, the prognosis that they gave at the start to, to everybody that was involved? Yeah, I think it was extremely scary. I guess I, when I was laying in the car, so when, when the, going back to the actual physical accident, um, the gentleman from the other vehicle came around and I said, mate, I need you to come over. To the, to, I need you to come and open my door because I was kind of squashed in the door. And he kind of pulled the door open. I said, I need you to undo my seatbelt. And he undid my seatbelt. And then I lied flat. I just I just kind of slid down on the seat and just laid there flat and, and couldn't move. Um, at that point, it was going through my head. I knew I was really messed up. And um, sorry, I get a little emotional if I was. Um, I, I knew I was really messed up, but I didn't know how bad. I knew I knew I was screwed, but I didn't know how badly I was messed up. And I, that, that was what scared me the most because I didn't know <clears throat> at that point if I'd ever see my kids again or anything. So that was the um, I did actually tell the ambulance driver to say goodbye to him for me. I didn't know. So I'm getting emotional. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, I did. The ambulance, the ambulance driver, and I wish I could find the guy and say thank you because he he was reassuring. He said to me, "Oh, mate, you, you're going to be fine." He said, kept saying, "You're going to be fine." And I, and, in my head, I knew I was, I knew I was screwed up, but I just didn't know if I'd ever do it again. And and if I, at that point, I, I didn't know if I could walk. I didn't know I had no feeling in anything. I didn't know what was going on. So it was extremely scary. And I and I think, like you say, if my wife at the time she uh, she when I went into surgery, they were like, okay, we got this, we got this, we got a you know he's got a broken neck, he's got this. But the worst thing at the the actually worst problem at that point was the internal bleeding. So even though my neck was broken, my back was broken, they were more worried about the internal bleeding. That's what was actually the thing that was going to be the most challenging. Wow. Now, so, you were obviously in the car with colleagues, and I believe you yep. were the worst injured. So what injuries did they sustain? So, yeah, so I was actually in the back seat. So the driver was uh, was my service manager, and in the front passenger seat was my um, my sales manager. So so the, the driver actually, he, he actually sustained – Different. We also seen very different injuries. So he actually pulled all the ligaments in his shoulders. He um, he shattered seven teeth because the airbag hit him in the in the bottom of the chin and shattered all his teeth. Uh, he had a bit of steel kind of puncture him in the stomach, and then um, he shattered his uh, left ankle as the engine kind of get pushed because the whole front of the car was basically pushed into the car. Uh, the engine came kind of pushed and and as it came through, kind of anything on that that left side of him kind of got messed up a little bit. Um, yeah, so he had, but he had a few other injuries, a little hernias and stuff like that. Um, and uh, the passenger in the front seat, um, he actually sustained uh, when he shattered his femur, his right femur. He broke both his wrists when he went. He put his hands up, and the airbag obviously shattered both his wrists. Uh, he broke his nose. Um, he's got a hernia that runs similar to where the seatbelt. The seatbelt does. As much as the seatbelt saves your life, it obviously does a little bit of damage in the process. So, you know, we, we'd all be, if we didn't have our seatbelts on, we wouldn't be here, but it, it does a little bit of, like, it causes a little bit of damage. Um, he shattered his nose, broke his wrists, femur. I think that was about it. He, he's, um, he's, he's, yeah, he took a long time for him to recover as well. So I imagine the driver of your vehicle, like, the accident wasn't his fault, but I imagine he would have felt a lot of guilt but how did you feel towards him and also the driver of the car that caused the accident? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't ever, it's never, so, so my service manager who's driving, it's, it wasn't his fault and, I, and, and, it was, and it was a total accident. So even the driver in the other vehicle, I don't have any anger towards him whatsoever. It's not, it was an accident. He was, he was I think he was 22, he was working. He tried to do the right thing. So the driver in the other vehicle had tried to call on the radio. So what the practice is up in the up in the top end of WA there when they're on those on those dirt roads, because they're all dirt roads and they're very dusty. So they, they call on the on the radio and say, you know, such and such following such and such on this road. Is it clear to pass? What happened on this scenario is that somebody another truck had actually responded to his radio message saying, yes, it's clear to pass, not the truck that he was actually following. So when he went to, he, he, he himself thought he was doing the right thing and went to pass and just unluckily enough, we just happened to be there. And it's, it's a one in a billion chance that they're, they're, those vehicles would come like that, but it just happened to be on the day. And it's, so I don't, I don't know, hold any, any animosity towards him whatsoever. It's, it was just unlucky. It really was. Absolutely. Cause those drivers up in the top end of WA, they're very experienced in that area. So, and they're very well aware of the dangers that can, can be there. 
So have you ever met the driver of the truck that actually gave the okay? Um, no, because there was criminal charges placed on the driver of the other vehicle. Um, and we went to court and there was a driver that came forward who believes that he was the one that said that. But he's not he wasn't sure. He, he goes, I don't know. I don't know. So um, there's never been because there were so many variables in it. There, there was it, it was very it's a lot of unknowns. There was nobody really knows. So the driver, the, the driver, the, 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 the truck that was going to be passed, that, but we passed him. We were in the dust cloud. He never stopped because he didn't know the accident happened. It was in his dust cloud. He never even knew it happened. So there was another driver that came there that thought that was him, but he wasn't even sure. So there was a lot of uncertainty around it. So what ended up happening with those criminal charges of the driver of the vehicle that caused the accident? Uh, yeah, so he ended up not getting charged, um, which is which, which is fine. I guess, look, he, um, it, they, they basically went to the case that he was doing the right process by calling on the radio. He did the right thing. He got the call clear to pass um, and basically, basically got off. So, um, yeah, so I don't think um, he never got charged. Which is fine. I'm not, it's not. He was a. He's a young guy. It was an accident. It was 100 percent an accident. So how did you rationalise that in your head? Because I know many people would just feel really sorry for themselves and really angry at that person, and you know want that person to feel the pain that they had felt. So how were you able to go? That's okay. It was an accident. Um, wasn't easy at first, and I'll be honest with you. When it, when, when the accident happened, um, my sales manager was in the front seat. If he could have got out of the vehicle, I think he would have attacked him. But um, he was luckily enough stuck in the vehicle and couldn't get out and attack him because he was he wanted he wanted to get hold of him. But um, for for myself, I, I think I, I don't. I've had my moments where I've been I've been cranky, where I, where I thought, well, why did he do that? But I, I think we've all made mistakes in the past. We've all done the done, done what you know had occasions where things haven't worked out as we, way we thought they would um and he, he didn't mean it uh, and I, i've met his I, when i was at court i met his mom and, and a few other people his family and they were they were lovely people they were so apologetic um i didn't get a chance to talk to the other driver um the driver of the other vehicle but um if i could talk to him now i would have no problems and say mate look it is what it is you know you know it's wasn't it wasn't intentional it wasn't like you tried to do something stupid you're just doing normal things so I, I basically had to accept it and move forward and just and it was an accident so do you think that was part of sort of your healing process to be able to let go of that yeah i think so i think definitely it has um it took it took look it's taken me a while to be able to say it like that i probably for the first few years i, I wouldn't have said the same um but looking back now yes so how long was your recovery period? So I was off work for, I guess it was probably, I was off work for six months. It, it basically, like I said, four, four and a half of that month was, was in hospital. Um, from there, I went and I did a lot of recovery at the gym and started trying to get, being able to, you know, get up and walk because because I was in, because I had a all the, the, all the injuries together. I couldn't walk for about, I think it was about two weeks. They couldn't couldn't actually stand me up and I had the, I had the whole frame around the head um, it was called a halo and they've got the they drew drill you know screws into your skull and they have like a whole scaffolding frame around your head to hold your neck straight and all that kind of stuff so it was really hard to, to sleep and um, but the recovery process once I was actually able to get up and walk and get out of hospital um, I started the rehab uh, it was probably before I felt back to my old self or as close to my old self as I could be, I probably took three years, three to four years. So, you know, it's funny. I get people still today, they come up to me and they say, oh, you know, Tony, how you feeling? You know, go good. And he goes, you're back to being 100%. And I say, well, my 100% before the accident is now, which is now 50%, but I'm 100% of my 50%. So I'm, I'm as good now as I've ever been, but it's just a different, different me. That would have been a lot to accept, though, as well, that you're not ever going to be back to how you were before. So what was your main concern when all this was going on? Was it your health? Was it your career? Was it your family? Was it your future? What was the main thing that you were worrying about while you were laying in hospital? Yeah, that's um, all of that. Uh, definitely my my, my, my health. Uh, I was always 
because I'm a very physical guy. I like to get out and do a lot of sport and, and then, you know, run around and do all sorts of crazy things. I like to water ski. I like to snow ski, um, all that stuff at that point in my, when I was laying in bed, <clears throat> I still didn't know if I was going to be able to walk properly or not. Um, you know, I was, I was concerned that all that stuff was gone. Um, definitely had a, had a moment in my, uh, a few moments in when I was laying in hospital about, you know, I worked so hard. I always put so much into my work and I had never taken a lot of holidays and it started kind of, I started realizing that, you know, we work, we work very hard, but we've also got to have our holidays and enjoy our family and, um, do that, that kind of external stuff outside of work. Um, so yeah. So do you think having sort of those moments made you sort of change your perspective of how you took on your future career? Definitely, definitely, yeah, Def definitely has. I, I, I definitely would take a roles now that are more life, family life balanced. Um, you know, I guess I'm in roles now where I can, if I, I can work from home every now and then, I can, I can, uh, I can do more, fle be more flexible with my family. If I need to take my kids to something or a doctor's appointment or whatever it is, I can do that without massive issues. Um, I think that's really important and it definitely has changed the way I look and I obviously look at myself and go, okay, you know what, I need to book in holidays more often. Not that we can book a holiday right now with this COVID thing, but um, you know, I'm looking forward to being able to to do something as soon as we can. Um, but yeah, I think it's made me it made me realize that it's really important to get your work life balance correct. You know, you need to make time for yourself. Definitely, but you were able to move on in such a positive way, which I think is so commendable. But whilst you sort of realized you still needed that work-life balance, you still got promoted and you still were moving up through the chain. So do you think your ability to continue to move upwards and onwards in your career was helpful to your overall recovery? Yes, yes, um, it was. It was one of the, it was, so when I was in hospital, I, I was I was basically busting to get out of the hospital just so I can get back to work, you know, I get back and then. I think one of the things that's helped me recover is basically being able to go back to work and be successful at what I do or try to be successful at what I do. Um, it gives me a bit of a drive to, to push myself and, and get better and, and, and all that stuff. So I think the, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely for promotion and, and doing well in my, my job and my, um, in my career has been helped me definitely get through a lot of the, the challenges and takes my mind. It probably took my mind off a lot of the, the, um, negative thoughts that might come from the accident i i still have you know that that i still get i still get flashbacks i still get you know times where i hear the sounds of the accident i still get times where i wake up and i think i'm in hospital i still have all that um it's just learning how to get through it and make and get and make it go away and, and one of the ways i do that is by keeping myself busy with work and family and all that kind of stuff so do you still stay in touch with the other guys that you were with at the time of the accident or do you find that sort of a bit more difficult to, to deal with them because it's in your face then? No, no, definitely not. We were definitely, um, we still talk. Uh, I probably, believe I've, I lost touch with one of them, but we still keep in touch every now and then via Facebook when it comes to birthdays or something, we'll send each other a message. But um, yeah, the, the, the one of the gentlemen lives in WA, um, definitely catch up with them probably once a month. We always just call for chat. Um, you know, we've, we've, he, he left the business that he, he was working for me at the time. He left the business and went and worked for a competitor. But with, with what we do, even competitors, we still stay close. And, and you know, we kind of call ourselves we're like we're a little bit like blood brothers, I guess. We were both, you know, in hospital for a very long time. And um, as much as it was, it was you know, pretty horrific, we, we made a lot of fun out of the deal. We had a lot of times where we joked around in hospital and had made, made the best of a, of a bad situation, you might say. So I suppose it was, you know, as sad as it was to go through it with other people, it probably helped to be able to go through it with other people in the same respect. Definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah, we bounced off each other because, you know, from a mental point of view, I guess you could imagine, like I was, I was stuck strapped to a bed for two weeks. I could not move. Uh, I, I, all I could, all I could move literally was my eyes. I could and I was basically strapped. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. And, um for anybody that's been stuck in the in a bed like that uh it just you know staring at a white ceiling for hours and hours every day you, your mind starts to play really bad tricks on you and and, and not only that they're you know while you're in hospital they're giving you painkillers and they're doing all this other stuff to you and and it just your body just goes out of whack and you literally kind of feel like you're totally losing the plot 
So having having the other boys to, to be able to talk to and and you know you know on the phone we used to put the phone next to us and have a bit of a chat just to see how each other were doing. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I guess from the accident and the ambulance guy said it when we got there when he got there was that all three of us kept communicating the whole time. We all kept checking on each other. So so the driver he could not he couldn't actually speak. All he could do was grunt because all of his teeth were shattered. Um, the gentleman and the sales manager he was. Uh, he was very vocal, but we all kept talking to each other to make sure we were okay for that whole time between the time the accident happened and the time the ambulance got there. And even after the ambulance got there, we were always checking up on each other. So I think we looked after each other really well. And I think we probably still do. That's awesome. Now, moving on from that, you've worked for a few different employers since then, and now you're in a sales and marketing role. Now, you've always been quite an outgoing, friendly sort of person, but how much different is a sales and marketing position to one of operations or in an office management sort of role? Yeah, this, this is the first sales role I've actually ever been in. So um, I've always been in, like I said, I've always been in operations roles or brand or management roles, of, of, but very operationally focused. So this is the first time I've taken a step out and gone into sales. Very different role. Um, it, it's funny because, you know, the, the, you got that nat natural enemy of operations versus sales. And I kind of feel like I've been on both sides now and I can, can feel like the, the villain, but both times. Um, but really enjoy the sales side and it's very different, um, but really enjoying it. So is it a much better? Obviously, sales and operations always have that um, tit for tat sort of thing. Sales just dumps things on operations and operations need to deliver it. So do you feel a little bit of joy now to be able to plonk that on somebody else's desk? Like you win the work and they have to deliver the, the results? A little bit sometimes. And I guess you're, you're right. But I do understand that there's more to the operations side. So I, I try to be not that uh, you know, some of the people say those arrogant sales guys say, here, just make it happen. I try not to be like that because there's obviously a lot of work. Everybody's, everybody's working hard to, to try to meet the end goal. So try to work with everyone. I, and it, I think because I've had that operational background, now that I jump into a sales role, I understand, um, I guess, more of uh, the actual what has to happen behind the scenes to deliver. So uh, definitely, yes, I, I don't. I like to come in and throw the order down on the desk and say, guys, we need to make this happen. What do we need to make it happen? And I try to work with them. And then and it's one of the things I like to, to say, I guess, is that if so I manage, I got my sales team. I, and one of the things I tell them is, is don't lie to the customers. If it's going to be two, three weeks to get it there, just tell them it's going to be two to three weeks to get it there. It's no point in saying one week and then have to tell them after a week it's going to be another two weeks. Just be straight up. I'd rather lose the order in the beginning than try to, you know, fix it at the other end. It just this is just be honest. And it, it seems and it and so far it seems to be working well for us. Perfect. So now a lot of organizations, they obviously have sales um, departments and then they have operations. Do you think that more employers should sort of cross train between those two functions to be able to make a more seamless uh, op operation overall? Yeah, you just broke up there, Christy, but I think um, I got the question. Um, yes, I, I think with the sales and operations, I think the closer they can work together, they're always going to have little silos where they, they work in their own with, with their own stuff. But um, the more they can work together and ingrain themselves together and work better together, uh, obviously the result will be better. So as much as they've got their own role, sales has got their own role, um, you know, sales, service, ops, all that kind of, they all got their own roles, their own little silos. But the more, the more you can bring them together and have everybody work closer together. And obviously it comes down to communication. The more you guys can talk to each other and actually, get that message across, you know, of what is actually happening, when it's happening, why it's happening, and, and, and then obviously deliver that to the end user, then I think it's all, it works well. So do you have I, a, I'm not a, not a, a preference in roles? Yeah. Um, I must say, I am really liking the sales side. I, I, I love the, um, I love being, I, I do like getting out and talking to people. I think it's, you know, you hear so many different stories and you meet all these lovely people throughout, you know, I get to work in some of the best sectors. I, I, I work in construction, I work in agriculture, I work in transport, I work in all these different areas. And, you know, some of the, some of the farmers that I've met throughout the years when I'm traveling, it, it's just been amazing. Like they're just some lovely people that do some amazing things out in, out in the land. You meet some of these construction workers that are engineers that have these great ideas and, and think just, they think at a different level to what I could ever think at. 
So I think I just get exposure to all these people that are such different diversity in what they do. And I think it just opens my mind to a, a way of, of just a different way of life. So how does your wide range of experience help you, do you think, in your day-to-day -day activities? I think because I started working pretty young and I guess I've gone through roles uh, different, you know, I've done pizza delivery, I've done bartending, I've done everything. So I've tried to, I think all of that kind of gives you the experience to, I think, be more patient and be a more, be a better listener and be a more patient towards people and their, and their, whether their, their challenge or their problem that they're trying to solve. Um, it just gives you a bit more understanding and I get more empathy, I guess, towards those people. But you've done a lot of different roles, a lot of different experiences. So you've seen a lot, been there, done a lot. Um, it just helps you get make the better decisions. So you've continued to be very successful in your career and you're very well respected by your peers. So what traits do you think are the most important for people entering the workforce? People entering the workforce? I would... I'm going to harp on about honesty. I think that I think you just got to be true. Um, I think obviously if you're entering the workforce, you need to find a job that you actually love doing. Um, I think a lot of people out there are in jobs that, that um, they don't like to do and they don't want to come to work every day. I think if you find something you really like to do and you enjoy doing, it makes your day so much easier. Um, and I've said that to people in my, in my employees in the past, and, and it's no disrespect to them, but I say if you don't like the job, maybe try to find something you do like. You spend way too much time doing doing work to live to find something that you just don't like doing. So, you know, we all have days where we don't like what we do or we don't we like, you know, not as much as the day before. But predominantly, as long as you enjoy what you do, that's important. But from a, from a trait, I would say honesty. I think people need to be honest with themselves, be honest with their employer and be honest with the people they're dealing with. So you're in a role that you're loving at the moment, but what's next for Tony? What's next? That's a good question. Um, look, I, I still want to progress up into a, a CEO type role or, or, or COO role. Um, so I guess I'm still striving to do that. I'm actually, I'm still looking at other courses now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking to do things. I'm, I'm actually listening to podcasts and some of there's some great podcasts from some of the, the management stuff out, uh, on, online that's fantastic. And I learn from that every day. Um, so I think there's still progression for me. I'm only, I don't know, I'm only 44. So I've still got another 20 years left to work in me, I think. So I've got plenty to go, plenty to do. And I, and I hope to see myself in a, in a, you know, running a business of some sort sooner and later. So, look, Tony, I've really enjoyed speaking with you today and I really thank you for sharing such a personal experience. But I do have the most important question of today. What would you do differently if only you knew? What would I do differently? Um, good question. I'm pretty happy with everything I've done in my life. I can't change what's happened. Um, but the things I would do differently is, is when I was... Uh, I guess if you say one of the things I would do differently is when I was in high school, I did not study hard. I flip, I just cruised through school and I just kind of didn't study and I was a bit, yeah, I just get through it, I'll pass. I look back now and I wish I would have actually put more effort into my studies back then, which I think would have made it easier to keep studying now. But um, I think that's probably one of the things that I would do differently. But as for moving to WA, the accident, all that stuff, it's made me who I am today and I'm happy with who I am today. Um, obviously there's a lot of challenges that will in along with that, but um, I'm very happy with where I'm at. Um, but if I could change anything, I'd probably go back to that high school and, and, and study and, and be a little bit more diligent with what I was doing back then and stop messing around like I was. So is that your advice to your kids at the moment? Yes, it is actually. Uh, I'm, like, I'm lucky with my kids. My daughter's My daughter did really well at her HSC last year. Um, my little guy who's studying now, he's actually doing really well. And my youngest daughter is doing really well at school. Um, I support them 100%. So if my son was to come to me tomorrow and say, Dad, I'd like to, to go into a trade, if that was what he thinks is the best thing for him, I would support him. I, I would like him to finish high school. But if he doesn't, well, that's that's his call. But, um, yeah, I, I, do prom I do recommend, I guess, people finish high school. I think it was really important that year 11 and 12 for me, as much as I had a lot of fun, you know, I, I think it was really important for me to actually graduate high school um, and not not stop and, and do a trade. I think I'm glad I, I'm really glad I finished high school. 
Look, Tony, as I said, I'm really pleased that you spoke to me today. And, you know, whilst it was an emotional sort of discussion, I'm really glad that it's one that we'll be able to have and to be able to share with the listeners. Now, I wish you all the best in the future. And I know that you're going to go on from, you know, strength to strength. And I really look forward to following your career. So thanks for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, Christy. If you'd like to know more about Tony, feel free to follow him on LinkedIn and his bio will be available on our website, if only you knew podcast.com.au. Thanks, Tony. Thank you very much. Thanks, Grant.